Make sure everyone has a copy of tonight's worksheet. If you need a copy of number 173, The Death of Christ, why don't you raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get one. All right, wonderful. Looks like we're all taken care of. I'd like for you to take the Word of God in your hands and open it, if you would, to Matthew chapter 27. And if you'll pause from finding your place there just for a moment, the first bullet point is this. We come today not just to the decisive center of the book of Matthew, but to the, to the decisive center of the whole of Scripture. The whole of Scripture. And this is important. I'm not going to labor on this fact, but um, it's important to see the Bible as a whole book. And if you do not see that, you're going to get uh, mixed up in a lot of things. But what God promised in the Old Covenant has come to us fully in the New Covenant, in the person of Jesus Christ. And He is the central figure. He is the central character. He is the central theme. But this decisive center of Scripture is the death of Christ. This is the center not only of Scripture, but to the entire story of God's redemption. Um, and not only the decisive center of God's redemptive story in history, but most importantly, this is the decisive center of your eternal destiny. This is such an important thing. And I'm speaking, of course, about the death of Jesus Christ. Let's read our text. It's very simple, four verses. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake. And the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, we pray that you would fulfill all of your promises to us, and you have said, call unto me and I will answer thee. You have taught us that you are a God who hears and answers prayer, and we have prayed, open our eyes, open our ears, and we ask that you would do just that. Lord, illumine our hearts, help us to see truth, and help us to be uh, so motivated by it. May our lives change because of what is read and what is taught and what is uh, understood in our hearts. So teach us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you a statement and then we'll build on that. The statement is very plainly, Jesus died creating access to God and eternal life for the saints. And so the first point is this, Jesus died. And we have to be clear about that. Matthew 27, verse 50 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. I believe that the cry Matthew is referring to is the phrase, it is finished. Luke says in Luke 23, verse 46, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. And so it seems Matthew is omitting his last spoken words. He cries out, it is finished. And then he yields up or gives up the ghost. Here's your first bullet point under number one. To give up the ghost or to yield up the ghost speaks about death. Jesus did not swoon. This was not fainting from a loss of blood or from the trauma, or anything like that, Jesus died. His, his life was completely gone from his body. Here's your bullet point. The word for ghost is often used to speak of the breath or the spirit 
and refers to the non-material part of man. And so you know man is made up of two parts. He is made up of soul and he is made up of body and he is bound together. They're twined together. We're not spirits trapped inside of a body or we're not bodies that have been animated by a spirit. We are a, a composite being. We're fused together. And sin damages and undoes and destroys that. But we have the promise of a resurrection, of a new body, and our spirits infused into a body made new, a body made whole. And so when I say new, it's not going to be somebody else's body. It's going to be your body remade, and that's a wonderful thing. The non-material part of man is often ignored when scientists want to talk about things. Um, It's the same as the Sadducees. They want to dismiss the supernatural Uh, But there's no reason to do that. There is no reason to do that. In fact, reason declares that there are certain things that cannot be measured or understood by material means alone. And if you were to corner a scientist, a modern scientism type scientist, not someone who um, merely goes along with the evidence... But corner someone who has given into the secular sort of idea of science and ask them to explain love. Measure love or commitment or something like vengeance. You know, can Darwin give us an explanation for rage and hatred and vengeance? What about justice? Can you measure these things with your tools, and the best they would say, well, natural processes, the random firing of, of synapses, and blah, 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 blah. And pardon my French, but that's baloney. <laughs> that's bull malarkey, you know, as the old folks used to say. The problem is you cannot deny things that are obvious and maintain the high ground for long. You can only tell so many lies before someone says, hey, that emperor has no clothes on. And that's exactly what's happening now. And and these strict materialists may be having their day in the sun, but it cannot last because it just denies the reality of the thing. Here's your next bullet point. The scripture makes it very clear that there is more to existence than the material world. But not only the scripture, we know this by experience. When you go to a funeral, and Lord willing, we're going to one Saturday of a dear friend, and you're not going to walk, no one's going to walk by and see the body laying there and say, this person is just fine, they are whole. Nobody says that. We know that something is absent, something is missing, something is gone, and we do not have scientific ways to measure the spiritual world, but we know there is a conjunction between the two. Immaterial does not mean unreal. And I'll say hopefully more about that on the Lord's Day. The reality is is, uh, the way the older generation spoke of it is that the immaterial world was the thick world. And the material world is the thin world. And we put all of our hopes into the thin world and forget that which is really thick. And uh, it's, it's a shame. At our creation, God breathed into our nostrils and man became a living soul. Jesus took on flesh and was made in the likeness of men. And here's your bullet point. When Christ died... There was a separation of body and spirit. This happens to everyone at the moment of death. And it's easy to think of reasons why Jesus would die. Uh, Brother John Piper wrote an excellent little book. It's a small book. It was used for evangelism. It's called 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. And it'd be fun to read them all, but there's no time for that. But he listed reasons like to absorb the wrath of God to achieve his own resurrection from the dead, to show the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners, to cancel 
the legal demands of the law against us for the forgiveness of our sins, to provide the basis for our justification, to bring us to faith and keep us faithful, to become a sympathetic and helpful priest, to create a people passionate for good works, to free us from bondage to the fear of death, to rescue us from final judgment, to show that the worst evil is meant by God for good, and many, many others. Lots of reasons. And it would be fun to make a list of all the reasons why Jesus came to die but that would be a really long sermon and eventually a series so I want to bring one all-important thought and here's your bullet point the sinless Jesus died so sinners might die to sin and live to righteousness why did Jesus die so that we might die Jesus died that's right so that we might die Jesus died so we could die to sin. Look at what the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And there's a huge difference between being dead in sin and being dead to sins. By our nature, by our first birth, born under the the condemnation of Adam's sin, born into the covenant of Adam's transgression, we were born in sin. But in the death of Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Peter's message implies that we could not be dead to sin. We could not be alive to righteousness if Jesus had not borne our sins in his own body on the cross. That there was no other way. There was no other way for sinners to become dead to their sin and alive to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Here's your bullet point. Had Jesus not suffered the wages of sin, we would be unable to die to our sins. We would die in our sin, but we could never die to our sin. And this might help us to think about who Jesus died for. I affirm what the apostle says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, about Christ's death for all. Notice this in your, in your notes. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. But there is a distinction between those who are dead with Christ and dead to sin and alive to righteousness. There is a distinction between those and those who are still dead in trespasses and sins. Notice, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It's there in your notes. You can flip over in your Bibles if you want to look at it. But the love of Christ constrains who? Us. And so would you be willing to agree with me that the Apostle Paul is saying those who have been made alive by Jesus are the ones who are constrained by his love? Would you agree with that? Those who have been made alive by Jesus are the ones who are being constrained by his love. The love of Christ constrains us, the ones who have been made alive in Christ. Well, since Jesus died for all, which is very plainly what Paul says, then verse 15 teaches us that all men should not live unto themselves but unto Jesus, the one who died for them and who rose again. I want to be very careful how I speak this, but it it seems pretty obvious that all men not only have an opportunity to trust Christ and be made free from sin and alive to righteousness, not just an opportunity, but an obligation an obligation. It doesn't sound to me like Paul is saying that all men are affected by Jesus' death in the same way. And you know that to be true. 
Perhaps I could say it like this. Notice in your, in your notes, your next bullet point. Does the death of Christ bring salvation to all men? No. So you can fill that in. That's your blank. It does not. Not all men are saved. For everyone who rejects the free gift of salvation, the death of Christ is the worst thing that could happen to them. For those of us who are saved, the death of Christ is the best thing that could ever happen for us. But for those who are not, you could not imagine a worse thing to occur. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10 said that those who rejected Moses' law were worthy of, and get this phrase because he uses it, death without mercy. And then he says in verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. And that's a question. If those who, who transgressed Moses' law were worthy of death without mercy, how much sorer punishment do you think someone will be guilty of who has rejected the blood of the covenant? Much sore. Infinitely sore. Here's your bullet point. Jesus died for all, but his death is not effectual for all. E-F-F, E-C-T, U-A-L. We know this is true. If it were, all men would go to heaven, but we know that not all men will. This is the great valley of decision, what Joel talks about. Here's your next bullet point. The death of Jesus is effectual for all who will believe in Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Praise God for that. But it is a severe witness, and I put it in all caps in my notes, against A-G-A-I-N-S-T, everyone who rejects Jesus. Do you know what this means? It means that no one will be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, well, in life I rejected Christ, but now I plead the blood. It just won't happen. You cannot reject Christ and have his sacrifice applied to your account. It's by faith that the blood of Christ is put on our account. Here's your bullet point. Only those who come to faith in this life find the death of Jesus is effectual for them. But what does the death of Jesus do for every believer, everyone who believes? What does it do? Peter tells us this. It's your last bullet point under number one. Jesus died so that we might be died to our sins, that we might be reckoned dead with him. And if we are reckoned dead with him, we will also live with him. And we can't wait to get to that sermon. That's going to be a good one. But we are dead with him. We are dead to sins. He died so that we might die. And this is a glorious, glorious reality. He died, and in Christ, we died to sin with him. And as he rose, we are risen to live with him. And Matthew's already nudging us towards that understanding. So uh, I don't know why this all is included, but there's two great things that happen here. Number two... Jesus died creating access to God. This is the first of the two things that Jesus' death does. You're in Matthew 27. Look at verse 51. Such a wild thing. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now verse 51 speaks about a veil in the temple and this is the same type of thing that a, a woman in the Middle East might wear. It was a curtain. It was a large curtain. It, was, it would be considered like a screen. Uh, not like a screen door but a screen between two different rooms. And this was a big thing 
Uh, we will talk a little bit about it, but I don't know that the thickness is as important as the height because the scripture, Matthew says it was ripped from the top to the bottom, giving us this vertical idea, which is beautiful and, and important. So let's have some explanation. Here's your first bullet point. When God taught his people about his worship and presence, he gave instructions on how to build a tabernacle. And later, Solomon built a temple, and the temple was very much like uh, the tabernacle. There were a lot of differences, but there were a lot of similarities. And in his instructions on the tabernacle, God gives this idea of a veil to be between the holy place and the most holy place. In Exodus 26, verse 31, in your notes, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made, and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver, and thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So the veil is a divider. It's a curtain. It divides between the holy place and that which is called the most holy place. Now, everything in the tabernacle was symbolic of something, and the veil was no exception. I think it's possible to go a little too far with this because God doesn't always give us an understanding, but some of the stuff, it's really plain exactly what he meant all of this to be. Here's your bullet point. This beautiful tapestry reminded God's people that sin separates them from God. No one was allowed to go behind the curtain and see the most holy place. This was not a, a place where people could go willy-nilly. Only the priest, once a year, could bring a sacrifice and enter into the most holy place. And God had ordained it so. The high priest had to bring a specific offering at a specific time, and this tradition carried over into the temple that Solomon built. Only now, instead of uh, a tabernacle with curtains and, and, and uh, tent pegs and ropes and things, it became an actual building, an actual structure. And so the veil grew in size. Well, that temple was destroyed, and uh, Herod comes along, and he rebuilds the temple. Now, Solomon's temple had a veil that was about 30 cubits high. Here's your bullet point. Josephus records the veil in Herod's temple was 40 cubits high, and it is impossible to know what a cubit was. So the net measurement I give you is approximate, 60 feet. About 60 feet from the top to the bottom. That's high. 60 feet. I remember being a kid at the Y going up to the 10-foot diving board and thinking I was going to die 10 feet. Good night. I'm going to fall that far. 20 feet, 30 feet, 40, 50, 60 feet. The reason this is important is because of what Matthew says in verse 51. Or verse 50. Yeah, 51. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Other historical sources record that this happened. Now, this, this is not like a Jerry Lewis movie where he pulls, starts pulling a string and, oh, the thing comes undone. This is a massive curtain. Some historians say it was over three inches thick. It was woven of all these different colors and, and just beautiful and massive, a gigantic screen, and no person could approach God unless they were the right person bearing the right sacrifice at the right time. And when Jesus died, God in heaven signifies to us he was the right person bearing the right gift at the right time, and the veil in the temple tore from the top to the bottom. Here's your bullet point. When Jesus' spirit left his body, the veil was rent in two pieces. Not bottom to top as in earth making a way to heaven, but from heaven to earth. And this is God. That's the blank. God making a way into his presence. In other words, God is saying there is a method by which you can approach me. 
You do not need to come through this veil into this holy place. You don't have to keep the old sacrificial system. There's a new access. The author of Hebrews says this, and Hebrews is so helpful regarding the death of Christ. In your notes, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And when the flesh of Jesus was torn for our sin, it not only enabled us to die to sin, and be alive to righteousness. It made a way for us to enter into the presence of God. It gave us access. And you don't need a priest to bring you to God. Jesus brings sinners to God. You don't need any person to go and plead your case before the Father. Jesus will plead your case before the Father. You don't need to go to confession Though confession can be good, and some of us need to confess, some of us, some of us more than others, <laughs> but Jesus pleads our case. Jesus brings us into the presence of God. Here's your bullet point. When Jesus died, the whole earth shook and quaked as a way to access God was opened up. Now Gentiles and Jews of all ages and both genders could access God by Jesus Christ. All people, no matter where you come from, no matter your age or stage in life, you come by Jesus and you're in. Come by Jesus and you're in. Sinners are rendered unfit to be in the presence of God by their nature, but Jesus had made, has made a new and living way for us to enter with boldness by his death. Here's your final bullet point. Under the old covenant, sacrifices were brought continually because they could never do what Jesus did, and that is once and for all render sinners spotless in the presence of God. This is what Jesus meant when he told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Met a Muslim man out knocking doors last night, and I asked him, what do you think of Jesus? And the conversation was over just like that. Because people reject Christ. They don't want to talk about Christ. But we must talk about Christ. He is the way. Because of Christ's death, our sin is atoned and we are declared righteous before God and we have a new and living way made for us into God's presence. There is a new veil, the torn and pierced flesh of Jesus Christ, which he willingly offered up for our sins. And then number three, Jesus died creating access to God and eternal life for the saints. So these two things that Jesus does in his death and us dying to sin and being alive to God, we now have access to God. The veil is rent, and we have eternal life in him. And I'm going to finish with a thought that is not well-developed in Scripture. Not the resurrection. The resurrection is well-developed. But this particular uh, resurrection is not well-developed. In fact, there's just a verse or two, and then we walk away from it, and we say, what happened there? Well, I'm probably going to tell you more than I know myself. So if you have more questions, we're going to expend my knowledge tonight. But I believe what the Bible says. Here's your first bullet point. At the death of Jesus, the graves of many Old Testament saints opened up and they went into Jerusalem and appeared to people after his resurrection. Now, that's precious little, but that's about all I know. Um, some of the reformers like Calvin believes that the graves were opened immediately by the earthquakes at Christ's death and the resurrection of certain saints occurred after his resurrection. Um, and and I, don't know, I, I don't know all of that timing. He says, for example, they, they would not, if the graves were open at the instant the veil was rent and their bodies arose, and then they remained in their graves until after his resurrection. Well, and they have reasons for believing that, but I don't know that I could be particular on all this timing. 
I do know that after the resurrection of Christ, other people were resurrected. I don't know who they are. I don't know for how long. I don't know if they lived another two years, two days, if, if they went up when Christ, before Christ. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I do know this in your notes, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Colossians 1.18 says a similar thing. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn. Which means there's others. There will be others after him. There will be others like him. I don't know that uh, I can pin down all these specifics. But I do know that he rose. And because he rose, those who believed in him rose with him. Here's your bullet point, and this is a, a good quote that I liked when I was reading from Calvin. He said, quote, Now by this sign it was made evident, evident that he neither died nor rose again in a private capacity, but in order to shed the odor of life on all believers. In other words, Jesus was not just dying and, and rising again and just saying, you know, this is what I could do, this is what I have done, and that's the end of it. No, he's the first fruits, and he has shed the, what he calls the odor of life onto all believers, and I think that's a pretty beautiful uh, explanation or way to say it. This was not a comprehensive resurrection as in every believer. This was a particular resurrection as in there were certain Old Testament saints who were resurrected, uh, but could you imagine you just try to imagine Jesus walking through Jerusalem after his resurrection with a contingent of Old Testament friends, a contingent of saints. At that point, it really wouldn't matter if it were David and Abraham or if it was someone that they knew, right? And that's my neighbor. He followed Jesus and then he died, you know, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. Oh, there he is, you know. It wouldn't matter at that point. It would have caused quite a stir. I want to say something about Matthew's phrasing here. He calls Jerusalem the holy city. And this can help us in a few things. Uh, Matthew did not stand in solidarity with the leadership of Jerusalem. And I find this interesting that the man has soundly and roundly uh, rejected the leadership of Jerusalem, but he still calls the city the holy city because God chose it and God put his name on it. He put his temple there. He made these people his people and nothing would undo that. And the saints in verse 52, many bodies of the saints those are the holy ones. And I like, I like how he words this, and you can see it here. Many bodies of the holy ones went into the holy city. And it's a fitting picture of that last resurrection when the new Jerusalem is established and all of God's saints are raised up to go into that holy city. And it's really going to be wonderful when we live where dwelleth righteousness. There's a city that we look for, and it's not Akron, it's not Talmadge, it's a heavenly city, and it's coming. There's a new resurrection. It's an answer to Jesus' prophecy regarding himself, and this all may happen soon, we don't know. Uh, and and for, let me say something real quick. Because we don't know, we should be busy and hopeful and active. The Lord may have ordained that his church will be here another 5,000 years. So we should work and build and be busy. People say, we don't know when Jesus is coming, so we should hoard food and ammo and lock our doors. No, no, no. It's the other way around. We don't know when Jesus is coming, and so we should be busy building and preaching and working, right? We should be busy because we don't know. And we want him to find us ready when he does come. 
Here's what the scripture says, John 12, 23 and 24. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And as long as Jesus lived, his, his life was reserved for himself alone. Here's your bullet point. When Jesus died, he no longer, and I know this is bad English, but quote, unquote, abideth alone. But because he died, he now extends his life to all of his people. The graves of believers are opened up. All who trust in him shall live in him. At the moment of his death, a way is made to God and life beyond death is offered to his people. And we, like those saints, have a hidden life in Christ. Our life is hidden in him. Their bodies were planted like seeds. And when Jesus called, they arose. Their bodies lay in the graves undisturbed until the earth shook and they opened up. Christ arose and reunited their spirits and their bodies. Well, let's end with this word from the Apostle Paul. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Where is our life? Oh, you who are dead to sins by the death of Christ, where is your life? You who are alive in him with access to the Father, your life is hidden with Christ in God. He rose again so that you could rise. And now, set your affection on things above put your heart on things above on the city to come on the coming king and may god help us and bless us that way would you bow with me in prayer father i thank you for your goodness towards us i thank you for the death of christ and for what it means Lord, I thank you that you loved us when we were unlovely. That you were willing to come and die on the cross. That you were willing to make a way. I thank you that I heard the gospel. I thank you that folks loved me enough to tell me the truth. Lord, I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful to them, but I'm thankful to you. Thank you for sending your son and making access for us to come into your presence. Lord, I pray that you would use us to carry this message as we go. Give us opportunities to speak to people about the death of of Jesus Christ father I pray that you would send a wonderful thing to us as a people and not just here in this room but in our cities and that is the conviction of sin so that this message of a sacrificial substitutionary Savior would be meaningful so that people could be delivered lord we pray that you would help us to relate rightly with you to not live in fear but to live in joy knowing that you have made access for us who believe in jesus and may we live in joy and victory god give us that 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 real peace inside and we pray that you would send into the world a spirit of conviction, a certain trembling of judgment to come. Lord, we are, we are weary of preaching the gospel uh, without effect. Lord, we want your spirit to move and work and bring fruit by us.
And we pray that you would do that. And Lord, we look forward to bringing in a harvest. And we thank you for how you're moving and working already. God, work and help and bless. Thanks again for Jesus dying. And I ask all of these things in his precious name with thanksgiving. Amen.